Greetings from the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's special program, Beethoven in America. This winter, we join music lovers around the world to mark the 250th anniversary of Ludwig von Beethoven's birth. Our featured document display on the National Archives Museum's website celebrates this anniversary with a close look at a piano score for Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. The highlighted page of music is from the 1888 bound volume called Beethoven Symphonies for Four Hands, which was a gift to President Harry S. Truman, a pianist and a well-known music lover. Truman's personal music library features an extensive sheet music collection and multiple recordings of Beethoven's compositions. To see the score and learn more about it, visit museum.archives.gov and click on exhibits. Now it's my pleasure to welcome tonight's panelists. Our moderator is Robert Aubrey Davis, the creator and host of Millennium of Music, heard on public radio stations nationwide, and host and moderator of WETA TV's Around Town. Our panelists are Michael Broyles, professor of musicology at Florida State University and author of the book Beethoven in America, Mina Yang, professor of arts and humanities at Minerva Schools at the Keck Graduate Institute, and author of Planet Beethoven, Classical Music at the Turn of the Millennium, and Kenvis Slowick, Artistic Director of the Smithsonian Chamber Music Society. Thank you for joining us today. Well, I see faces. I assume we can all be heard and we can just start right in. I'm just going to uh, go with that belief uh, because I have uh, a, a tremendous uh, a, a sense of joy and happiness at, at this experience. First, uh, let me pay tribute to the Smithsonian Chamber Orchestra and that wonderful recording from uh, 1987, the late great uh, Jaap Schroeder and uh, Kenneth will have a little chat about uh, how 2020 started off in the worst possible way with the death of Jaap Schroeder on January the 1st, 2020, believe it or not. Kenneth Slowick, of course, uh, who directs, as you just heard, uh, all the work that's done at Smithsonian, Smithsonian Chamber Music Festival and all that glory. Uh, we are joined thrillingly by Michael Boyles and by Mina Yang and the topic and a very, I have to say, both interesting and amusing one uh, is the tale of uh, what happens when you have Beethoven come to our shores. But Ken, I want to grab you first, if I possibly can, because I want to, uh, before we get any further, since we just had the chief archivist and we have, uh, you know, uh, Tom Nastic and Susan uh, Clifton with us, Behind their backs while they're not paying attention, I just want to take one minute to say something that I think I know you would reinforce, and that is that in the history of music, you have, if without libraries, without archives, without the unbelievably unsung hard work of people like librarians and archivists who get no credit and no glory, we'd be almost nowhere, wouldn't we? That's certainly true, and I would add to that uh, museums which are a little more public and visible in that sense, but no less important in preserving sometimes very ephemeral artifacts uh, that have to do with composers. Yeah, that is an extraordinary thing. And before we launch into the talk about Beethoven coming to America, because I, I've known you so long and I know you so well, I also know that you, uh, while you have one or two books behind you with the words Beethoven on them, you also have one of the great collections of, uh, well, I, I call it the Beethoven slideshow. Uh, basically, that's what it is. I mean, you can actually take us on this amazing journey. And I, if I could presume upon you for a moment, if you wouldn't mind taking us on this journey, I'd be thrilled to go on it myself. Well, okay, I will uh, try to compress it uh, as much as possible. And I've chosen just a few highlights uh, sprinkled in amongst many, not all, but many of the contemporary uh, pictorial depictions of Beethoven. So if we could start with the first slide, 
since we uh, were just talking about museums and archives, this is uh, the house in which Beethoven was born, now known as the Beethoven House in Bonn, and uh, turned into a wonderful museum with all kinds of uh, things relating to him. Next slide, please. Uh, here, it, it, I should say that the, the uh, museum has been largely redone for the 2020 uh, celebrations of the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth. But uh, when I visited and took this picture, uh, this is in the room where, and this was before that happened, I don't know what it looks like now, but this is the room where Beethoven was actually born. And the bust from the 1870s has been displayed on a pedestal uh, at Beethoven's actual height which some people have said was five feet, two inches. Some others have given him an additional two inches, making it five, four. But this giant of music was uh, by modern terms, a rather small man. Next slide, please. Uh, Bonn was the electoral uh, city, one of the electoral cities in the, um, in the Holy Roman Empire. And it was ruled by this man at the time of uh, Beethoven's life there, Maximilian, who was uh, the, an archbishop as well as the elector. Uh, and he was the Archduke of Austria. That means he was the youngest brother of uh, Joseph II, who was known for his many uh, celebrated reforms, which included emancipation of the serfs, secularization of church lands, tax and judicial uh, reforms. And like his brother, Maximilian cultivated enlightenment thought at his court from uh, Rousseau and Montesquieu to Kant, Klopstock and Schiller. These ideals made a long lasting impression on the young Beethoven as can be seen in many of his writings and also in works such as Fidelio with its theme of freedom for the unjustly imprisoned or the Ninth Symphony's setting of Schiller's Ode de Joy which proclaims that all men will be brothers. In November of 1792, Beethoven left uh, for Vienna for an unspecified length of time. In fact, he spent the rest of his life there, but he was to receive, in the words of one well-wisher, the spirit of Mozart from the hand of Haydn. Next slide, please. Mozart had uh, been dead for only, uh, we have next slide, please. Yeah, had only been dead for a year or so. And the next slide, please. And Haydn was just coming back from the first of his two trips to London, which made him, in the words of one uh, present day biographer, the most celebrated composer who had ever existed up to that point. Have next slide, please. Beethoven, when he went to Vienna, was more known as a virtuoso pianist at first than as a composer. So it's hardly surprising that he chose to make his first opus published there, the three piano trios, each in four movements, very serious. And of course, he eventually left us seven wonderful trios of major size, a, a number of smaller ones, five piano concerti, and 32 piano sonatas. Next slide, please. He also wrote, uh, as we know, nine symphonies, the first dedicated to Baron von Swieten, who had introduced Mozart and Beethoven as well to many works of Johann Sebastian Bach and Handel. Next slide, please. Uh, he also, uh, in the time around the turn of the century, was at work on the first six quartets, the string quartets he wrote, his opus 18, out of the eventual 16, which spanned all the way from work in the very last years of the decades of the uh, uh, 18th century into just before his death. They were dedicated to this man, uh, Prince Lobkowitz, who was a lifelong uh, supporter as long as he could be. Next slide, please. And now I'm coming up with the first of a few pictures of Beethoven, this one from 1800. The next slide, please, from 1801. Quite handsome there. Uh, next slide, please. In 1802, on the advice of his doctor, Beethoven spent some months in the summer and early fall in the town of Heiligenstadt, uh, which was uh, in the suburbs, uh, now as part of the incorporated larger area of Vienna. Next slide, please. And while he was there in October, he penned a letter, which was like the famous immortal beloved letter, uh, letter never delivered uh, and found and published only after Beethoven's death. But this letter in which he addressed his two brothers uh, speaks of his uh, encroaching deafness 
and uh, apologizes if fear of having it discovered has made him seem misanthropic and confessed that only his art kept him from suicide. Uh, next slide, please. We have a few more pictures of Beethoven. This one from 1803, a little miniature. Next slide, please. Then this one from 1804, a rather uh, posed image, yeah, Beethoven as Orpheus holding on to a lyre, uh, a ruined tree over his left shoulder and his right hand held up as if he's about to tell us something very important and some ruins of Greek or Roman style uh, just behind. Next slide, please. Uh, this is Napoleon. Uh, we all know the story since we just heard uh, the Eroica finale. Next slide, please. Uh, which is that Beethoven's pupil Ferdinand Ries came in to tell Beethoven that Napoleon, whom he had admired, uh, had just declared himself the emperor and uh, Beethoven flew into a rage according to Ries and scratched out below, below Sinfonia Grande there intitulata Bonaparte, uh, and uh, is said, is Napoleon too nothing more than an ordinary human being? Now he too will trample on all the rights of man and only indulge his ambition. He will exalt himself above all others and become tyrant. Uh, so the uh, next slide, please, shows a picture of Beethoven just a few years later in 1806. Next slide, please is a plaster life mask uh, taken in 1812 in preparation for a bust by the sculptor Klein. Uh, the wet plaster was lathered on and the subject had to breathe through straws inserted into his nostrils. Uh, Beethoven couldn't stand it and broke the first uh, mask before the plaster had completely set. Uh, and, but that maybe uh, accounts for some of the very severe nature of his uh, mean at this point. Next slide, please. This is the bust, which uh, looks like bronze, but is actually just uh, painted plaster. Next slide, please. Uh, this was a time when Beethoven was increasingly uh, having trouble hearing, and the inventor Metzel, whom we know as the inventor of the metronome, made these uh, various ear trumpets for him. Next slide, please. This is a uh, drawing from a uh, simple point engraving, I should say, uh, from 1814, which Beethoven thought was the best likeness that had ever been done of him, and he had many copies made and hand covered for distribution to his friends. Next slide, please. Uh, this is, is, is the brother, uh, the older of the, of the two brothers, but still younger than Ludwig, um, who was uh, called Johann. He had been an apothecary. He eventually became a landowner uh, near Krems in Austria. And uh, Beethoven once uh, addressed him, a letter to him as uh, Johann von Beethoven, landowner, from Ludwig von Beethoven, brain owner. <laughs> I think is quite typical. Next uh, slide, please. In the, the next slide, we have a picture of Beethoven from 1815, the first of three portraits from that year. Next slide, please. This one uh, hangs in the Whitall Pavilion at the Library of Congress. You can, uh, when the library is back open again, you may go see it. And the next one also, please. Also from 1815, and here we see what becomes typical in portraiture of Beethoven about this time, which is often his eyes are looking up to heaven as if uh, seeking inspiration or communing with the, the Godhead uh, somehow. Next slide, please. Uh, here, uh, one of two very famous uh, sketches by uh, Klober from 1818. Next slide, please with the Leonid, Leonid uh, head of hair. Uh, next slide, please. From 1819, uh, again with the eyes uh, looking heavenward. The next slide, please. The official portrait from 1820, which was adopted as the uh, official symbol for the uh, Beethoven houses and Beethoven archives celebrations of 250th anniversary. Uh, Beethoven with the Misa Solemnis, which he dedicated to his pupil, uh, the Archduke 
uh, Rudolph, who was being elevated to become a cardinal. Next slide, please. Uh, Beethoven in 1823. Next slide. Beethoven on the streets of Vienna, where he was well known for his rather eccentric walking in 1823 also. The next slide, please. Shows him from behind uh, with his cudgel-like walking stick, directing, conducting some music that only he could hear. The next slide shows Beethoven on his deathbed in 1823. Seven, and the next slide uh, shows the will, which he wrote three days before his death in a very spidery, weak hand, leaving everything he had to his nephew, Carl. And the next slide, please, uh, shows the plaster death mask taken. Uh, he's already rather sunken uh, from not only the effects of the death, but uh, some medical interventions that were done. And the final slide is a picture of uh, the next slide, please, of Beethoven's funeral, uh, which uh, 20,000 people attended, a very, very long cortege. And you might say this is the beginning of the posthumous Beethoven cult, uh, of which our classical music scene is still certainly a part. Mm. Well, thank you, Kenneth, uh, for that. And, and Michael, if you roll that clock back quite a bit in that set of pictures, I was stunned that you revealed unto me the first time we heard Beethoven on our shores. Tell us about that date and how that happened. The first time was uh, in 1805 and it was in Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston was uh, at the time, one of the most sophisticated cities in the country. Um, and it had a lot of wealthy people who had formed what they called an academy where they, which is really a concert society. And we know that the first symphony, or we believe it was the first symphony, was played then. Uh, it was called an overture, but that was typical of the time to start a concert with something called an overture. It was usually a symphony. And by process of elimination, we can say it has to be the first, the first movement of the first symphony. And that's about all we know about it, uh, because it doesn't tell us anymore. We don't know where uh, Eckerd, the uh, uh, conductor, got the score because he arrived in 1776, I believe it was. And so, it, you know, it's, it's a mystery. And we don't hear much more about it, except they repeated the same thing, uh, or at least the Beethoven, the next year. Other than that, it's, it's a mystery. When do we start getting Beethoven in a more familiar way in this country? That's a good, that's a very good point. For the next, actually about 35 years, we have sporadic, sporadic, excuse me, uh, notices that something by Beethoven was played, but not much. But starting about 1840, he becomes, starts to become an icon in this country. And I think there are about two or three reasons for why. And the main reason, believe it or not, is the railroad. And the reason I say that is because one of the things that happened at that time is that European virtuosi started coming to this country. Uh, and because, because of the railroad, uh, for example, Baltimore to Philadelphia is 90 miles. Before the railroad, it took about three days to make that journey, and, to, and not today. But by 1840, when the railroad came in, it was five hours. So it made traveling virtuosi possible. And let me add also that before 1840, nobody thought of music as art. Uh, it was entertainment. It was not one of the arts like you know literature or painting or sculpture or anything, but it was just pure entertainment. But when these virtuosi started to come, people started to rethink things. And the next thing that happened uh, was in 1841, Boston founded an important orchestra, not the later Boston Symphony, but an important orchestra. And in 1842, New York founded the New York Philharmonic, which is the New York Philharmonic today. And uh, they started playing Beethoven, especially the Fifth Symphony. And it's not an exaggeration to say the crowds went wild. They'd never heard anything like that before. And so those two things, the virtuosi and the symphony and the railroad began the Beethoven cult in this country. And I mean, uh, we can sort of pick up the story with uh, sort of the cult of Beethoven evolving and then kind of uh, hitting a commercial uh, aspect as well, right? Well, yeah. oh, go ahead, then I go, you go. Um, yes, and I would also add to that, that 
Beethoven is also a story of immigration. So we have in the 19th century, the immigration of Germans into, our, into the US uh, and bringing their love and their practice of playing Beethoven. And then we have the Jewish immigrants during the Holocaust and they enriched the classical music scene in the U.S. tremendously. And now we have a lot of Asians coming to the U.S. And, you know, among a lot of youth symphonies, you see just a preponderance of Asians who are continuing this practice. Um, and then, yes, the commercialization is a very interesting aspect of this. So we see with the growth of the recording industry, Beethoven is a key player. Um, you might know the famous story about how the length of a CD was determined by the length of a Beethoven symphony. Um, and uh, we have more recently a lot of more um, commercial attempts to hit at what Beethoven stands for. So if you look at, you know, the children's music um, industry, where a lot of classical music gets sold as being, you know, good for kids developing brains. And so Beethoven has come to stand for a lot of things besides just his music. Yeah, and do let me say, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you want to uh, ask a question, put them in the uh, YouTube chat. And if we have time at the end of all of this, we'll, we'll try and, and get around to it. And uh, Kenneth, you've been doing this a while. Uh, has Beethoven changed over the decades that you've been uh, working uh, in the vineyards over there at the uh, Smithsonian? Well, certainly uh, the idea of historic performance practice has caught on in a big way. I remember when we began with the Schroeder, the uh, Smithson Quartet in 1982, and we played nothing but Haydn for two years. It was a wonderful way of, of learning that repertoire and learning to be a quartet. Uh, Haydn's still one of my favorites. Uh, but at first people were rather shocked because at that time, they really, with the exception of a quartet, which Joppa had before, the Quartet of Esterhazy, there was really not much in the way of Beethoven, of quartet music, I should say, on period instruments. And uh, gradually people got to think, well, Haydn, this is very good, this is revelatory, uh, but we wouldn't want to hear Mozart or, or certainly not Beethoven this way. Well, after the second year, we began playing more Mozart. Well, all right, Mozart, all right, but not Beethoven, please. And uh, we made uh, eventually recording of the Opus uh, 18 quartets, the first one on period instruments, and we won prizes for this recording all over except in Germany. And mm -hmm. all of the German critics thought this was horrible. This is not Beethoven as we know, this is not our Beethoven. Well, uh, that was originally uh, made for EMI and uh, uh, gradually got sold and, and ended up back on Sony BMG. And it was re-released about 20 years later in Germany and the, all over the world. In fact, we got very many nice reviews from Germany. And I thought they, I thought, well, you know, the, the wheels of justice grind slowly, but they come around. <laughs> um, so, but, but that is just indicative of the way that uh, the period instrument uh, uh, movement has caught on, not only for Baroque music where it might be said to have started, but also now through the classic and even later. And he, and you know, of course, Haydn becomes that gateway between the Baroque and Beethoven, and the perfect bridge because he learned from Baroque masters and was a great master and admired by all after him. Beethoven, of course, Mozart, Schubert, who was attending that very funeral we saw the uh, the picture of there at the end, and, and Michael. Really, from the mid of the nineteenth century, we start getting kind of a little bit of a, a Beethoven cult. Uh, uh, the archivist uh, was talking about the piano version of the Beethoven Fifth. Well. You know, when people didn't have record players before they were invented, that's how people played Beethoven. Symphonies and the like is from these amazing transcriptions, you know. Exactly. Uh, and we have so many transcriptions from the 19th century from, you know, ones that, uh, well, I'll use the word dilettantes could play or, you know, anyone could play to some rather elaborate ones that people like Liszt played. And, uh, and this, of course, is in, in uh, Europe, but nevertheless, the music came over to this country. And a lot of virtuosi, and as I say, starting in the 1840s, you have a lot of virtuosi, including pianists like De Meyer, Talberg, and others. Uh, they would often play transcriptions just because so many people, that was the only way they could hear it. Unless you were living somewhere where there was an orchestra and an orchestra that capable of playing Beethoven, you had no opportunity, of course, to hear it. We're, we're so fortunate today well, starting in the early part of the 20th century, 
to be able to hear this stuff as it, you know, certainly as I want, I don't want to say as Beethoven wrote it, because that would get us into a big argument with Kenneth about early <laughs> music. But anyway, uh, to hear it in, you know, in its, in its basic form. Uh, so transcriptions mattered a lot in, uh, in uh, expanding the Beethoven no uh, people's knowledge. Because really at the end of the 19th century, at the cusp of the invention and perfection of the recording industry, you had piano rules. And a lot of that Beethoven, because, you know, the very earliest discs were, you know, really limited to three minutes at the maximum. So you really genuinely had longer works on these piano rules. And people spent a lot of money on this and player pianos. And you know, they would gather together and hear these works together. It was a communal experience. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, let me just add a couple of things there. Uh, there was the standard player piano, and then there was the kind of player piano that tried to reproduce the nuances. And uh, Ampex was one, and uh, I forget the other name of the, the other one. Sir. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. And, uh, and so that really helped. I might also add that in, from the days of the early 78s, they were trying to record these longer pieces. In fact, one of the things I've often wondered about, Wagner's Tannhäuser, the complete Tannhäuser was recorded in 1903. And it took 27 pounds of, re of <laughs> records to first one to hear the whole thing. So there was all sorts of attempts from the early days to get this music on, on this. All, all those young people nowadays don't know what an album is. An album is not a single recording. It is many, 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 many discs together that make up one piece. And they were yes. in an album, quite literally, mm -hmm. which is amazing to think about. And you think about from those early virtuoso days, you talk about the early uh, immigrations, Mina, but literally that, that goes to the late 19th and very early 20th century as well. We have uh, emigres coming in and bringing this music and both traveling and recording it at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. I would and, also uh, add when we talk about, um, you know, piano transcriptions of Beethoven's music, there's a famous piece by Charles Ives, who is one of the, you know, the big composers from the a native US composer. And he has a piece called the Alcots, which is supposed to be kind of an impression of what the cacophonous nature of domestic music making was like. And there are quotations of Beethoven's fifth throughout that movement, which is quite wonderful. It also explains why for Elisa is so doggone popular. It fit, fit perfectly in that smaller format, either a cylinder or on a 78 the way that the humoresque of Dvorak got to be one of our greatest hits in American history in the early part of the 20th century, the perfect length, and was a great tune, like for Elisa is as well, you know. Uh, and, and these are the kinds of things that, you know, we now have this weird differentiation. And Kenneth and I have had this conversation in pre-concert seminars for a million years about, you know, how now art music is separate from popular music and they cannot be joined. But there was a time everybody, you know, people, for them hearing, you know, uh, uh, humoresque or for Elisa, that was music. It wasn't like somehow that was some different kind of a piece, you know, uh, that was music and people love that music. And I think we can all maybe more in the loss of that and hope it comes back again. There's something that I think we should mourn, but we don't usually because the advantages are, are so much, uh, so strong that we seem to, to lose track of the disadvantages, but that is that ever since the dawn of recording and particularly as it got better. And then particularly when we went to digital recording and things got smaller and smaller, Walkman first and then the iPad, iPad and so on, iPod rather. Uh, now we can have anything we want just like that, a touch of a button or a click of a mouse. But up until that time, if you wanted music, as Michael said, you had to be in the presence of someone doing it or do it yourself. And so that wonderful uh, gift of the gods that constitutes music and its reception early on uh, has become something so ubiquitous that now we sometimes have to try to block it out in the elevators or supermarkets or whatever. And I was thinking about this when I looked at the uh, page that's up on the archive uh, from Harry Truman's uh, Beethoven Fifth. It's a secundo part. It's the, the part that played the bass stuff in the, in the first movement of Beethoven Fifth. 
uh, and the accompanying text says something, but everybody knows this piece, whether they think they do or not. It goes short, 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 long. Uh, and just looking at that, it's of course a reduction and an arrangement, but you can see that rhythm, ba 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 all over the place. And I think if you were actually to sit down and play it with your sister or whomever, uh, you were playing that part, you would have a different and more vital experience about just how that, that, that little motif permeates the whole thing than you do necessarily even going to a wonderful symphony recording and, and hearing it. So I mourn the fact that, that music is not more uh, hands-on experience for more people these days. Although maybe in the last year, more people are finding music that way, which is That's uh, true. A friend of mine who runs a piano store said he's never had such good sales. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, there, there, there may be some, some positive things to come out of all of yeah, that. May I, add, may I add something to this please, to the please, question please, of please. popular versus classical? I see that beginning to break down. Good. Uh, and you look at young composers, especially today, they are not making that distinction. And, you know, they're using as much rock as they do Bach. And so, uh, and I think it's healthy. I think it's healthy. Uh, part of it has to do with, you know, in the 19th century, we started this whole idea of sacralization where certain music has, and John S. Dwight was the one that really pushed that, there has some sort of sacred quality, even though it's secular music, and it has a strong moral quality. And that has done a lot for classical music, but it's also, I think, hurt classical music in certain ways because it creates expectations, especially for people who are not heavily into classical music. But now with young people, it's becoming, you know, just whatever music you like. We see this all the time in teaching. I, I teach graduate courses and students who are not music majors. And it's fascinating uh, to see how they are thinking. And it makes me feel that, well, maybe I am as old as I am or something like that. Uh, so, so it's an interesting thing going on. Because you know, even though Beethoven was a, a very serious man and wrote very serious music and all of his contemporaries were maybe a, a little more playful with using dances and popular ditties, Beethoven certainly did. And you think about, yes, he was paid good cash money for it, but all of those English and Welsh and Irish and Scottish folk songs that kind of flowed out and all that kind of thing that he was writing, he was very prolific in that world. I know he got some friendship and support from, uh, from Haydn for all that, Kenneth, but you know, uh, literally you, you think about those people that incorporated popular dances of the day. And I think Beethoven himself was rather defensive of his eighth symphony, which, you know, he called his little F major because it was considered too light and not profound enough. But I think he delighted in that sort of thing. I think he probably took actual delight in the Sixth Symphony in ways he might not have taken in some of his other pieces. I think that was just a wonderful experience for him to write maybe something a little lighter. Am well, I crazy? The last movement of the Eroica began as a dance. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right, you know, and I think that's that is a very, very good point and mixing up all of those kinds of things together, I, I think is, is good for for one and all. And, and by the way, I do think that that would be good for the next generations, meaning you were talking about young people and you know this whole idea. Uh, actually, through the Recording Academy, I've worked extensively with the real universities doing research into what what music can do and different kinds of music for different kinds of people. And the one thing that's universally true is that uh, this music is good for almost everyone in some way or the other. It's hard to quantify, but whether you are old or you are young and maybe losing your faculties, maybe you have PTSD, maybe you've had a traumatic experience. One thing you can definitely say is that hearing this kind of music is a healing experience that you can prove. Uh, whether it's, you know, Mozart makes you smarter, maybe making you better is better than making you smarter. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. There are some, there are some wonderful stories about that. Um, Oliver Sacks, if you've, if you've ever read his Audiophilia, he has some wonderful stories about just, you know, the way that music works in the human brain. It's, it's very mysterious and it does have these amazing healing powers. Um, but, but, but people who've had accidents also lose some one aspect of their music making abilities. It's, it's, it's really fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Now, Michael, you sent me this quote, which I'm dying to talk about. We know Beethoven, but we don't really know Beethoven. I kind of agree with that, but tell me why I agree with that. 
<laughs> well, if you talk about people that say aren't heavily into classical music, uh, there's about what, four or five pieces are fragments of pieces that everybody knows. Of course, pop, 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 pop is the big one. Uh, and then Furelis, which was mentioned earlier, uh, is another one. Um, and some of the Sixth Symphony and um, oh, a few other, few other pieces, of course, the Ode to Joy, uh, people know. And if maybe the, a, a lot of people would know the second movement of the Seventh Symphony, although they wouldn't know that's what it is because it's been used in quite a few commercials and things like TV commercials and stuff like that. And so beyond that, uh, that's, you know, and we, you know, and then of course the biography, oh, they know Beethoven, oh, he's that deaf guy. And that's essentially what they know. Uh, oh, I might add the image itself, you know, this, uh, well, however you want to describe it, uh, you know, this square jaw with the scowl and the bad hair and all of that stuff, uh, his, this image, is probably as recognizable as almost any person in American society, uh, which is kind of ironic because here you have this German guy that lived 250 years ago. And the, you know, if, 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 uh, Kenneth was putting up the images of Haydn and Mozart and other people, a, lo a lot of people, that is people that are not classical music concert goers would not recognize those people, but they would recognize Beethoven. So there's something ironic about that. And of course, we all know there's so much to Beethoven beyond this handful of uh, pieces or fragments. Yeah, because we have actually a question from uh, one of our viewers. How much did Beethoven's work get influenced by whoever was funding him and who was commissioning these pieces? We talked about that a little bit. And it's actually kind of a good question because, you know, we're all, we, we had a stretch for many centuries where you kind of wrote basically what your patron and the person paying you cash money wanted you to, to write. What about Beethoven? Well, Beethoven is interesting because he certainly uh, made use of the patronage system, but on his own terms. Uh, that, and there's some argument about how much he made use of the power, how he made use of it, but, but basically he would not have ever have worn a servant's uniform like Haydn did. Mm -hmm. uh, and he certainly was a revolutionary when it came to politics. And uh, he uh, sort of insisted that the princes that financed him, uh, you know, treated him not as obviously as an equal, but as close as he could get. Um, he actually once wrote a letter to, uh, I believe it was Prince Lichnowsky, uh, where he said, you know, you are a prince by birth and there will be many princes after you. After all, there is only one Beethoven. And um, later when uh, he and Goethe, and this is in 1812 or so, were walking along the street and the emperor uh, came by and Goethe, sort of, who was very much a diplomat, uh, moved to the side and took his hat off, but Beethoven refused to, to you know, yield to the, even to the emperor. So we have, we have that and somehow he managed to pull it off, uh, which I, I think probably because so, some of these princes were really afraid of what was going on in France. Mm. And uh, I'm not sure if had, that had happened 10 or 20 years ago, like in Haydn's time. I don't think he could have pulled it off, but you know, that's contrafacta. Mm. Yeah. Hop in anybody, anybody want to think about that? No, I think that's quite, quite true. Uh, and that there was also such a high level of appreciation among the Viennese nobility for virtuosity, instrumental virtuosity. And also we think about uh, Karl Philipp Emanuel Bach, who wrote in the 1780s, a number of publications uh, that were designed for Kenner und Liebhaber, for connoisseurs and amateurs, amateurs in the sense of those who really loved things. So that the, the uh, I have to say, that's the kind of audience that I, hope to cultivate too, uh, the people who understand some of it. Mozart, of course, famously wrote to his father at one point that his three uh, concerti, which he had written, had pleased everybody as he knew they would because he wrote things that would be immediately understandable and appreciated by anyone, but also would have in their kernels things that only the connoisseur could understand and, and therefore they seek that uh, sort of thing out. So the, the level of appreciation was very high. And uh, an, another uh, famous uh, thing was that uh, 
uh, Prince Lefinovsky, with whom Beethoven lived for a while when he came to Vienna, uh, had hoped that Beethoven would come every day and get dressed up for dinner and so on. And Beethoven finally said, no, I refuse to do that. And the prince let him get away with it uh, mm. because of his appreciation for what he saw as his genius. Mm. I think we do need to mention the historical context also. So, I mean, this is about the time when the commercial music industry is really starting to blossom. So, you know, in Haydn's time, it would have been very difficult for him to leave his patronage and to strike out on his own as, you know, a viable freelance artist. Whereas in Beethoven's time, that became much more possible. And certainly Beethoven was part of the driving force behind that. Um, you know, he was really very hard nosed in his dealings with publishers. Uh, he made sure he got paid well. And so all the things that we think about classical music as being somehow transcendent of commercial concerns, that, that's not entirely true. That, you know, a lot of people like Beethoven cared a lot about making money uh, and he helped to uh, make the music industry something that could survive without noble patronage. Yeah, that, was, that was a big deal, the evolution of publishing and how that happened. Was a big well, Beethoven always <clears throat> was upset that he didn't get a court appointment. And uh, so in 1808, when the younger brother of Napoleon, Jérôme Bonaparte, had been named King of Westphalia, uh, had his court at Kassel, and uh, invited Beethoven to come and be his resident composer. Uh, Beethoven used it as a kind of a wedge to get three members of the upper nobility to grant him an annuity contract so that if he stayed in Vienna, they would pay him so much per year. Unfortunately, uh, the next years, uh, next year of 1809, Napoleon was back living in Schönbrunn and uh, things were quite terrible. And the inflation has been calculated to be as much as between the late 1790s and the end of Beethoven's life, as much as 42 times uh, diminution in purchasing power. Uh, so that, that uh, it was a hard uh, effort to get that annuity restored or lifted up to another level. So Beethoven played both, both sides of the, of the game, you might say. And he had learned something from, from, although he claimed at one point that he never learned anything from Haydn, the music certainly betrays that. But also even Haydn, once he was able to publish, would often send off scores at the same time to a Viennese publisher, an English publisher, a Parisian publisher, say. Uh, and they each thought maybe that they were getting exclusive rights, but that wasn't the case. And both Haydn and Beethoven uh, found themselves embarrassed <laughs> when that ruse was discovered by the publishers. You had to get your money up front because copyright laws were a very different universe. And so even uh, from the time of Handel and trying to track down who was publishing his work, that was a very tricky thing. And that gets, that gets better. That gets better in the 19th century, but that took a while. Well, we talked about the value of archiving and what that means. Uh, now we have to project, well, 250 years from now or even a century from now, if you want. And what do we think Beethoven will be then? And anybody wants to jump in? Mina, maybe you can go first. What, take us to the future. What will that be like? Well, I imagine, um, as Michael mentioned earlier, there, there has been a lot of mashups of classical and popular genres. So I imagine that will become even more commonplace. I mean, it's true that with streaming, we're not participating in music in the same way as we used to actually making the music ourselves. But I, I think a lot of people just grow up listening to just a huge range of music. And so they're sort of you know, ingredients for how they make new music is quite different. It's, it's just a lot more varied than what we grew up with. Um, so I think it, it, there'll just be more and more mashups and Beethoven will be in there, but we might not even, you know, hear big chunks of it as him. It's just maybe little snippets here and there. Although we do have that European Union Ode to Joy that's used everywhere and all the time from the fall of the Berlin Wall to every time there's a massively important event. Uh, there it is. So you certainly have uh, the Ninth Symphony out there, no matter what. Uh, uh, Michael, come to the future. What do you think? Well, uh, I, I have to agree with Mina about a lot of this. And if you also look at what symphony orchestras are doing today, they are trying, they are breaking down the barrier, mainly out of necessity, uh, trying to get people to come in and get, get, you know, the younger audience, which is the future audience, and well, in 250 years, uh, I won't go that far, but certainly in the future, I think 
Uh, I think Beethoven is going to be around, uh, but in and I think that the not the internet so much, but just modern media communication has been using Beethoven in so many ways that he kind of kind of seeps into our consciousness, not for, not always when we're aware of it, or at least when most people are aware of it. I think that's going to continue. That music is not going to go away. And, uh, and the more that happens, the more I think that uh, people are going to say, yeah, oh, that's Beethoven and things like that. Uh, if I can, uh, back in the 1970s, I remember hearing a late night commercial. If anybody's, I'm maybe the only one here old enough to remember the 1970s, but if, if uh, they had these late night uh, TV commercials that were god awful and everything. And there was one that was trying to sell a recording of the 100 greatest melodies. Do you and, hear that? It's the music yeah. of Borodin. That's exactly <laughs> how they started it. I remember it very well. And the announcer actually said, I remember this vividly, had said, now you can hear Beethoven's famous Ode to Joy without having to sit through an entire symphony. <laughs> yes. so, right. you know, uh, but hearing, just hearing the Ode to Joy will make a few people curious enough. Maybe, maybe they'll want to sit through an entire symphony or at least maybe an entire symphony movement, uh, so things like that. So it's, he's, gonna, he's gonna be around. It's just, we don't know exactly in what way. And because, and, I mean, who could have predicted the internet and the social media 30 or 40 years ago? Uh, so it'd be really interesting to see what communication methods are there, but I think Bebeto is still gonna be in all of it. Yeah, and, and Kenneth, there you are uh, having to preside both as a musical person, but also as a museum person and uh, having to look to the present and the future, even trickier. What, what, what can you prognosticate for us, do you think? Well, certainly um, one of the things that, that as an instrument curator, I'm always interested in is to see where there have been major collections of instruments. And so our Stradivari uh, quintet, for instance, uh, when it came to the museum, several of my colleagues said, well, what does that have to do with American history? Uh, these uh, 17th and early 18th century Italian instruments. And I said, just follow the money. <laughs> I think of all the things that came here during the uh, then 19th century of the Gilded Age and so on. Uh, now there have been uh, one of the cellists in the National Symphony uh, had a Stradivari cello, which his parents had bought for him when he was a teenager, showing great promise. And he recently sold it uh, and it was sold to the uh, Russian state. Uh, I was told by a dealer who had something to do with these things that uh, uh, Gergev's orchestra now has four Strad cellos in it. Mm. Uh, th so wow. there is that, but they're also then in relation to Beethoven uh, and the classical music in general, of course, uh, many people have said, you wanna see the, the future of classical music, look to the Orient. Uh, to China, to Japan, Korea, where they're certainly still studied. And uh, in my teaching work, we have seen over the last 30 years, maybe Michael, you've seen this too. Uh, so many, first the Japanese students, uh, then the Korean students, uh, then the uh, Taiwanese students, and even some mainland China, uh, Chinese students who are, are coming. Uh, some of them will stay here, but many of them are going back to orchestras uh, in their home countries. So we have a question, which we have to get to here. Uh, in the future of the U.S. specifically, how would you describe which rock star these note from 1965 to 19 to 2021? So you can expand forward. You think most closely relates to Beethoven in terms of both temperament and social disposition. That's a tricky thing because I mean on the one hand you have the Billy Idol types but you also have to get the level of genius up so that's going to be a very tricky answer. Good luck everybody. Hop on in. <clears throat> but a hip-hop artist Kendrick Lamar let's say. Okay all right. <laughs> I don't know if they've ever been compared together but you know. Um, Somebody had to be first. Brilliant musician. Brilliant musician. Um, you know very uh very um, poetic in his 
text and music, and uh, and he has a very strong position in terms of his social politics. Interesting. Michael, you want to jump in there? Okay, well, uh, this is going to be strange. I, I'm i going to say Brian Wilson, who of course is the Beach Boys. The, uh, is it Wilson? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I think he was one of the a real musical genius uh, that, you know, he did, did all the Beach Boys arrangements by going in and simply singing the part for each person, which he had worked out in his head and then put it all together. And he, he was certainly uh, had psychological issues, shall we say, if nothing else. Uh, but uh, I, he was no question about my mind, in my mind about him being a genius. And uh, he wasn't, I don't know if he was the angry person that Beethoven was, but he clearly had lots of psychological factors that uh, had uh, affected his career. Yeah, maybe the Robert Schumann Brian Wilson might be that. That, yeah, might, that, be, might, be that, that might be closer for <laughs> yeah, sure. I think you're right. Yeah, Kenneth, any any meditations on that? You can say Mick Jagger was your favorite. I know that. Yeah, I, I although I uh, in the '70s was quite involved with uh, particularly the black music scene uh, in Chicago, uh, commercial recording. Uh, I have left that behind, uh, so I, I haven't really kept kept up. I would maybe turn the, the question around a bit and uh, say, what about people who are known for pop music who still have a great love for Beethoven or Bach, or I'm thinking, for instance, Keith Jarrett, uh, who mm -hmm. made recordings of, of Bach off to the side. There are quite a few of them. I don't, they don't all come to... Um, well, Paul, right Paul, Paul McCartney, for example, who went into choral music. Uh, I mean, there's a whole body of these people. Carl Jenkins, who left rock and went into choral music. There's a whole lot of people who left sort of the pop rock world and went into choral, inspired by these people of the past and they are still working. Yeah, which is wonderful, I think. Yeah. And some of them look back. I mean, very specifically, Sting looks back to John Dallin and Robert Schumann, but he also notates uh, Beethoven as one of his influences. So there you have that right there, you know? So yeah, that's that's definitely one of the things, you know? Well, before we wrap up, let's let everybody have one last meditation or thought. Uh, Mina, ladies first, what do you think? Just to generally, um, I, I think that um, it's been a very interesting year and we were supposed to have a huge Beethoven celebration all year round and it didn't really happen because concert halls got shut down. Um, so I think it's it's really, I, I think, you know, we, we might want to spend a little bit of time thinking about Beethoven against the backdrop of the pandemic, against the backdrop of the Black Lives Matter movement all of the things that happened this year. And I think uh, there's some relevance there. Um, and I think, you know, it's a good time to reassess what Beethoven means in our society. And, you know, uh, is he going to continue to have that kind of meaning, which we started to think about here. Mm. Yeah, Michael? I think Mena said some very good things about 2020. And uh, I won't repeat them exactly because I would not have said something differently. But in, in terms of Beethoven, I think what's interesting here is that Beethoven has meant and continues to mean so many things to different people. And even in a time like this, uh, I think he's been important. Uh, he's become sort of a symbol that traverses aesthetic preferences and even ethnicity. Uh, he's uh, over every, every part of popular music, you'll find him. Rap, swing, uh, country, uh, everything. Uh, and uh, in that sense, um, I think we can continue to see him as, in some ways, very much an inspiration, just like you were talking about the Ninth Symphony and the European Union and things like that. Uh, so, He'll be with us one way or the other. Yeah, yeah Ken? I think that uh, Beethoven was very much a man of the enlightenment. And as long as those uh, moral and political 
ideals are still represented in our society, he has a lot to say to us. Uh, also, although we are increasingly bombarded with shorter and shorter fragments and, and things are being sampled and, and used again, there is something to be said for the contemplative and maybe even the physically healing experience of listening to a classical composition, following the argument, if you will, uh, as the same way that you might have a different experience reading a great 19th century novel uh, than watching a television series. Uh, and so I hope that, that those people who want that experience will continue to have it. In a way, you know, I think that, that uh, just like the great art collections we have in town here exist that can be visited by anybody you can walk in free to the National Gallery and, and look. Uh, there's something very democratic about the way that classical music and other high culture, uh, which is not to denigrate at all what, what Michael was saying about the, the difference between high culture and, and low culture, but these high cultural things which do require a certain amount of effort. Uh, but they're there for anybody from any background who wants to put the time and effort into it. And I think that's, you know, if you think that Beethoven wrote for the nobility in many cases, certainly his predecessors uh, did. And now it's available to, to all. It's, it's in my musician's myopia, a, a bit of uh, a part of the American dream, in fact. Because we've had, you know, uh some films about Beethoven, Immortal Beloved and Beethoven's Copyist and a few others, but we've never quite had, say, the Amadeus of Beethoven and uh, something that is so remarkable and so much larger as a representation of a great artist. And I, maybe that might mean it be the next generation's gift to us all as kind of an examination uh, of that. That would be quite an extraordinary thing. Uh, uh, and, and I think that would be a great gift for everybody, you know? I could put a plug in uh, for a film that I like very much, uh, which was a BBC film called The Day Music Changed Forever, I think it's called. Uh, and it's about the Eroica Symphony mm -hmm. uh, and really pulls together in a way that most of these other films uh, just mash up uh, historical fact and fiction together. This, I think there's a, it has some faux pas, but it's pretty good. And has a wonderful performance of the Eroica uh, by John Lennon Gardner's uh, group. And even the man who plays Beethoven conducts almost, well, not really believably, they never do, do they? But, <laughs> you know, better than, than, than many. So if you could find that, uh, it, it gives some interesting relationship of, of just how revolutionary uh, Beethoven appeared in 1805. Well, thank you all so very much. Uh, thank you for watching along with all of us. And of course, uh, thanks especially to the National Archives, that incredible unsung heroic work that is done by uh, the archives and by archivists is uh, something without which none of us would be able to do uh, the kind of thing we do uh, in the arts and letters. And it is just uh, a joy to share that with all of you and Minna and Michael and Kenneth, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Susan, everybody at the archives and well, bless you all. And we will see you for the next big celebration.